In Jesus' name we pray. Our Father, we thank you for the session we come to now, which is to study your word. We are praying, O oh Lord, that you grant us understanding as we look at the word, even now, in Jesus' name. Speak directly to every one of us and grant us the strength to stand in the truth for the truth defending the word of God. In Jesus' name we pray. The special series of studies we'll be having for our Congress this year will be in the Epistle General of Jude. This is a very brief but urgent and powerful epistle and it is needed by the church today. And without wasting time, we want to go into this a brief epistle. We'll be studying the epistle in four different studies. And this time now, we'll be concentrating on verses 1, 2, and 3. Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to them that are sanctified by God the Father and preserved in Jesus Christ and called mercy unto you and peace and love be multiplied beloved when i gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that ye should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints those are the three verses we're looking at today but before we get into the study of those three verses, we need to understand something about the epistle itself. We need to run through generally and see what key we can have as we look at the interpretation and application of the message of the epistle. The first word you have is the name of the writer, Jude. That name Jude is the abbreviation of the name Judas. And as we look at the New Testament, there are six men that uh, were named Judas in the New Testament. And we need to determine the one that actually wrote this epistle of Jude or of Judas as uh, Judas is the real name but just abbreviated and shortened to Jude. The most uh, popular and notorious of the people in the New Testament that bears the name Judas is Judas Iscariot and you find that in Matthew chapter 10 and in verse 4 where we're given the list of the 12 apostles of the Lord Jesus Christ it starts from verse 1, then verse 2 gives us the names, and then in verse 4, Simon the Canaanite and Judas Iscariot who also betrayed him. Obviously, you know that Judas Iscariot was not the one that wrote the epistle that we are studying. You know that for obvious reasons. He hanged himself, he died, even before the resurrection of the Lord. And this epistle, as well as all the other epistles, were written after the resurrection, after the ascension. So that knocks out Judas Iscariot as a writer. There's another Judas, and um, this is Judas, not Iscariot. You need to make that differentiation in your mind as uh, you come across this is another apostle as well another of the 12 and it's referred to as judas not iscariot in john chapter 14 verse 22 judas saith unto him not iscariot lord how is it that thou wilt manifest thyself unto us and not unto the world and so we have another Jude, another Judas, not Iscariot. As we look at the other lists of the apostles of the Lord Jesus Christ in Luke chapter 6, verse 16. We won't read that now. And Acts chapter 1, verse 13. This is that same person referred to as Lebaos as well as Thaddeus. 
we go to the third one this third one was mentioned when the disciples were being persecuted and then Gamaliel stood up and he told them the reason why they shouldn't worry to persecute or to uh, do any havoc to these apostles and he reminded them of the history that they already knew that's in Acts chapter 5 this is Judas number 3 now Acts chapter 5 in verse 37 after this man rose up Judas of Galilee in the days of the taxing and drew away much people after him he also perished and all even as many as obeyed him were dispersed so we have another Judas there and obviously he wasn't the writer of the epistle we're studying Jude we have another Judas that is mentioned in Acts chapter 9 the Lord was talking to Ananias and he was telling Ananias where he will find Saul of Tarsus because Saul of Tarsus had met the Lord on the way to Damascus and now the Lord wanted to direct Ananias as to where he will get this Saul and pray for him in Acts chapter 9 and verse 11 and the Lord said unto him arise and go into the street which is called straight and inquire in the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus for behold he prayed uh, that was uh, another Judas we find in Damascus referred to as the Judas of uh, Damascus and Saul was in his house he was praying and the Lord directed Ananias to go there and it is in that Judas that wrote uh, the epistle we're studying number five uh, Judas we have in Acts chapter 15 Acts chapter 15 verse 22 this Judas was very well known to the apostles in Jerusalem and here is what uh, we hear of him in verse 22 then pleased each the apostles and elders with the whole church and saint chosen men of their own company to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas and namely Judas and so named Barsabbas and Silas chief men among the brethren these were famous well-known men in uh, the in the church and Judas this other Judas was one of them so named Barsabbas again he wasn't the one that wrote the epistle now we come to the last one and obviously since I've told you that the first five were not uh, the people that wrote the epistle of Jude you must be guessing then that it is this last one we're looking at Matthew now chapter 13 to find another man named Judas in the New Testament in Matthew chapter 13 verse 55 it's not this the carpenter's son is not his mother called Mary and his brethren James and Joseph and Simon and Judas here is another Judas what do we know of this particular Judas he was um, a child of Mary although the Catholic Church will like to say that uh, Mary didn't have any other child but that's just the dogma of the Catholic Church here we know that uh, Mary had other children it's not this the carpenter's son it's not his mother called Mary and his brethren that is the sons the other children of uh, Mary James and Joseph and Simon and Judas not only that he had four other boys look at verse 56 and his sisters we don't know how many but at least two are they not all with us whence then has this man all these things it is this uh, jude or judas that wrote the epistle of jude there are some people that have thought that it couldn't have been this Judas and their understanding is that it is the other one the Judas among the twelve because as you read the if you read Luke chapter 6 verse 16 and Acts of the Apostles chapter 1 verse uh, 13 
it talks about that other judas and you will see your king james version of the bible brother of james the problem with that is that as you look at uh, your text very well brother is written in italics which means that that was not in the original in the original it says judas of james and uh, more research uh, in the word of god and more research in the original language has now shown us that that judas of james was the son of james but this jude we're read reading about is the brother of james and the brother of jesus then another thing that may come to your mind come back to jude now jude the servant of jesus you see, but a Jew did not even mention that he was a brother to Jesus. Yes, that is true. You will find if you read James himself, uh, look at James chapter 1 verse 1. In James chapter 1 verse 1, James is servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. But don't you know, this wasn't the James that was beheaded. This is the James, the brother of Jesus. But you see, after the resurrection the line human line of relationship had been cancelled in their mind they knew that jesus christ although born by the same mother they knew that he wasn't born the same way they were born he was born without any kind of relationship with joseph and therefore when he rose from the dead and when he ascended to heaven they began to realize that this was not just ordinary human being they knew that it was god very god and therefore they will not refer to the natural relationship they will refer to him as their lord that's why james born of the same mother will not refer to himself as a brother of the lord jesus but he said a servant a slave a born slave of the lord jesus christ the same thing you'll find peter saying a servant of the lord jesus the same thing you'll find uh, paul saying in philippians chapter 1 verse 1 a servant of the lord jesus christ and uh, why did jude or james or peter or paul call themselves the servant of the lord jesus Jesus is their humility, is their submission, is their consecration. Now they will not know him after the flesh, but they knew him because he had come from the Father. They express their humility here. Now, as so we come back to the epistle general of, J of Jude, here is something that you will see. You will see that he's talking about apostates. Apostates are the people that forsake God apostates are the people that stop preaching christ and they're preaching against the lord he was talking about the people that forsook the lord now hold these two words in your mind apostles and apostates apostles are the people that were standing for the lord jesus christ they had been sent by the lord apostates were the people that had not been sent by the lord but they came to corrupt the word of god now i said that to say this as you read the acts you have the history authentic history of the early church and the history of the early church the acts of the holy ghost through the chosen men of god you have that record in the acts of the apostles but then these ones that were sent and motivated and inspired by evil spirit to go against the truth of the word of god jude is writing about them and as we go into the epistle eventually you will see that these are the acts of the apostates on the other hand you are having the acts of the apostles over here the acts of the apostates what was the purpose of jude the purpose of jude is stated in verse 3 it tells us it was needful for me to write unto you and to exhort you that ye should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints he was urging the believers to steadfastness and he was warning them against the teachers of heresies it's going to take us four studies before we can finish the epistle and uh, try to look at every verse and try to see what message the lord has for us in the epistle but in this um, first um, study we're going to look at three points the title of this study is earnestly contending for the faith and i've divided this into three parts number one 
the content and the characteristics of the epistle the content and the characteristics of the epistle as we look at this epistle there are many interesting things to see here and there are some characteristics to see in the epistle and of course the content is very important number two call by christ into the faith call by christ into the faith and then number three contending for the faith contending for the faith number one the content and the characteristics of the epistle the epistle is clearly practical and yet very deeply theological as you look at this little epistle what do you see the epistle is talking about grace and it talks about sin and it talks about christ it talks about authority it talks about christian unity it talks about the last things you pick a little epistle of 25 verses and that short brief pungent powerful epistle is talking about christ it's talking about sin it's talking about uh, salvation it's talking about the practical life of the believer and it's talking about the unity of the christians it's talking about eschatology the last things then you must know that the epistle is loaded and it is full it is an epistle that exposes lost the flesh the fleshly lusts of the apostates and also exposes the intellectual pride as well as the spiritual presumption which the false teachers were trying to propagate within the body of the believers as we look at verses 16 to 19 you will see that it exposes them it says these are murmurers and complainers they are walking after their own lusts their mouth speaketh great swelling words with men sad, having men's, admira men's persons in admiration because of advantage. And then he tells us in verse 18, they are simply mockers that have arisen in the last time and they are walking after their ungodly lusts. Now this epistle is not only that it's warning us of the fleshly lust and the intellectual pride and the spiritual presumption of these false teachers, you will see that from first to last, as you look at this epistle, it is a Christocentric. That means it has Christ as the center of the message and the theme and everything that is saying. Everything is built around Christ. Look at verse 1. It talks about Jesus Christ. We are preserved, we are kept in Jesus Christ. Look at verse 4. It talks about these people that are denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. As you look at verse 17, it says, Beloved, remember ye the words which were spoken before of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. In verse 21, you are to keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ christ unto eternal life in verse 25 to the only wise god our savior be glory and majesty dominion and power both now and forever you will see that the center of the epistle although very short he mentions christ not only that he climaxes this epistle with the only god our savior i've read that to you already and now think about the things he mentions he mentions the father in verse 1 he mentions jesus christ in many verses he mentions the holy spirit in verse 20 but ye beloved building up yourselves on your most holy faith praying in the holy ghost very short episode and yet he's talking about christ he's talking about the father and he's talking about the holy spirit it is trinitarian in his treatment of the subject matter that he's looking at now talking about god this short epistle exalts god as a god of grace and glory you'll find that in verse 4 you'll find it in verse 24 he exalts god as a god of mercy and majesty verse 2 and verse 25 you find him exalting god as a god of love and judgment it's in verse 2 it's in verse 6 it's in verse 15 it's in verse 21 it's exalting god as a god of peace and a god of power verses 2 and 25 is a god of 
salvation, not destruction. And then is the God of both time and eternity. The only wise God, the glory and majesty, uh, dominion and power, both now, that's time, and ever, that's eternity. And so you see that this epistle, although it is very short, it is uh, very full. And you find a Jude on bringing everything you can even think about in Christianity and in Christian teaching and doctrine, bringing everything to this little epistle. Very basic. To Jude's whole presentation is the inescapable relationship between belief and behavior. In fact, if you look at the whole epistle, that's what the epistle is telling us. It's telling us that there is the inescapable relationship, a link you cannot break between what you believe and how you behave. It's telling us there is a link between error and evil. If you are wrong in doctrine, you'll be wrong in lifestyle. If you have error in what you believe and what you teach, you are going to have evil in your character. Like your creed, so will be your character. Like your belief, so will be your behavior. And uh, he keeps a very good balance between the wrath of God and the love of God. Here is not a lopsided epistle. You will find in this epistle that it tells us very clearly of the love of God. And that's the love of God that gives us mercy, that gives us grace. And his love, his peace, is multiplied unto us and yet he will not forget to give us a note of warning that if we remain in sin there is judgment he highlights the doctrine of the Lord's return and the doctrine of the judgment day and of eternal fire for the wicked and eternal life for the righteous well there's another thing you notice as you look at this epistle of uh, Jude this apostle, uh, this uh, writer Jude, is very fond of what we call triplets. That is three things. And uh, as you look at the whole epistle, you'll find it says one, two, three. He goes to another verse, one, two, three. He goes to another verse, one, two, three. The epistle is full of triplets. Why don't you look at verse one? Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ, and brother of James to them. Now these are the triplets. Number one, sanctified by God the Father. Number two, preserved in Jesus Christ. And number three, called. It's telling us about the believers and it says there are three things about them. They are called, they are beloved, they are sanctified, they are preserved. And then in verse two, he gives us another triplet of mercy and peace and love place and then he goes on and you also come to verse 4 you're looking at another triplet is mentioning our God he mentions our only Lord God and he mentions our Lord Jesus Christ he just makes sure that uh, the triplets is not uh, missing even there then as you look at verse 8 verse 8 likewise also these uh, filthy dreamers what do they do number one they defile the flesh number two they despise dominion and he's going to complete it number three they speak evil of dignities so you see that he's very fond of um, triplets in verse 11 now in verse 11 warn to them what have they done they have gone in the way of Cain number one they have run greedily after the era of Balaam number two for reward number three they perished in the gain saying of Corey he mentions uh, Cain he mentions Balaam he mentions Corey and he said they, they went they've gone then they increased their speed they ran and in their running they met their doom they perished and so you will see as you study very closely that this is not an epistle you can just uh, pass by and wave off uh, you need to really study to see the beauty and to see the depth of what he's saying let me complete uh, Jude's uh, triplets for you now we are in verse 16 they are murmurers they are complainers they are walking 
after their own lust. Their mouth speaketh uh, great swelling words, having men's uh, persons in admiration because of advantage. They are walking, they are speaking, and they are having men's persons in admiration. Three things. Again, in verse 19, these be they, what do they do? Number one, they separate themselves. Number two, they are sensual. Number three, they do not have the spirit. And as you go to verses 20 and 21, it tells us how you are to, what you are to do. Your responsibility in the days of apostasy. What are you to do? Number one, you are building up yourself. Number two, you are keeping yourself in your most holy faith and in the love of God. Number three, you are looking for the mercy of God, for the mercy of Christ as he is to come. And so you find those characteristics in um, the epistle of jude there's another thing before i leave that point one the content of jude now as you study the epistle of jude you will find that there is a very close similarity between jude and um, second peter let's make a comparison now look at jude verse 4. jude verse 4 for there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation ungodly men turning the grace of our god into lasciviousness and denying the only lord god our and our lord jesus christ put your hand in a jude but come to second peter now and remember what we have read we have read about these men that crept into the church that means they came in privately without the members of the church knowing and they're trying to turn the grace of god into lasciviousness excess liberty and they feel that they could do anything in fact they ended up denying the only lord god how similar to second peter is that second peter chapter 2 from verse 1 but there were false prophets also among the people even as there shall be false teachers among you who privately privilege shall bring in that nimble heresies denying the lord that bought them and bring upon themselves swift destruction and so you will see the similarity there it's not finished yet look at verse 7 of jude jude verse 7 even as sodom and gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh are set forth for an example of suffering the vengeance of eternal fire in warning the believers jude brought the example for illustration of sodom and gomorrah turn back to second peter now second peter chapter 2 verse 6 and turning the cities of sodom and gomorrah into ashes condemned them with an overthrow making them an example unto those that after should live ungodly you see the similarities there jude verse 8 likewise also these filthy dreamers they defile the flesh they despise dominion and they speak evil of dignitaries does peter have anything to say about that second peter chapter 2 verse 10 but chiefly them that walk after the flesh in the lust of uncleanness, the despised government, presumptuous are they, self-willed. They are not afraid to speak evil of dignities. You see the similarities between them in Jude verse 9. Yet Michael the archangel when contending with the devil he disputed about the body of moses does not bring railing does not bring against him a railing accusation but said the lord rebuked thee here what jude is telling us is that these people who are speaking evil against dignitaries 
do, don't they understand that when the contention was heard between Satan and the archangel concerning the body of Moses, that Michael, the archangel, did not bring railing accusation against Satan. He's saying the greatest of angels, good angels, did not bring any accusation or false allegation against the worst of fallen angels. And in Second Peter, Second Peter, reading from verse 11, Whereas angels, which are greater in power and mind, bring not railing accusation against them before the lord if you as you compare you will see very clearly that you have similarities among um, among both of them or between both of them look at jude now verse 10 but they speak evil of those things which they know not but what they know naturally as brute beasts in those things they corrupt themselves and in second peter chapter 2 verse 12 but these as natural brute beasts made to be taken and destroyed speak evil of the things that they understand not and shall utterly perish in their own corruption in jude uh, verse um, 11 warn to them for they have gone in the way of Cain and ran greedily after the heir of Balaam for reward and perished in the gainsaying of Corey. In Second Peter chapter two verse fifteen, which have forsaken the right way and have gone astray, following the way of Balaam the son of Bosom, who loved the wages of unrighteousness. Jude verse sixteen now. These are murmurers, complainers, walking after their own lusts, and their mouths speaketh great swelling words, having men's persons in admiration because of advantage. And now in um, Second Peter, chapter two. Second Peter, chapter two. Reading from verse 18, For when they speak great swelling words of vanity, their law, through the lust of the flesh, through much wantonness, those that were clean escaped from them who live in error. Well, you say, if there's so much similarity between Jude and Second Peter, why will the Lord give us Jude? Since uh, Second Peter has been written, and Second Peter is even longer than Jude, why don't we then take Jude away and don't worry about Jude? Well, the Lord has a reason for uh, retaining Jude in the canon of Scripture. Number one, what Peter said is coming. When Peter was writing, he said, "Children of God, servants of the Lord, false prophets are coming." And uh, you find Peter writing in the future tense, and he said, they will come, they will come, they are coming. When Jude was writing, Jude said, it's not just in the future, now they are here, they have come. And you don't find the future tense as such in Jude. You find it's referring to something that has taken place already. What the author said will be coming, Jude said, the scripture is fulfilled already, they are here. Do you see the importance of that in scripture? Because you see, when you read the Old Testament, it took 700 years, it took 1,000 years, it took sometimes 2,000 years for some prophecies to be fulfilled. In fact, there are some prophecies in Daniel, in Zechariah, in Isaiah, that are not yet fulfilled now. They'll be fulfilled at the second coming of the Lord. And don't you know that in the same generation that Peter was right there, he had not even died, and he wrote and said, these things are coming and Jude now wrote and said children of God if you have read Peter Peter said it is coming now it is here the fulfillment of prophecy within that same generation that's the reason it is there not only that if you know scriptures you will know that there are some very important things that are repeated in scripture and you have that principle coming all the way from Genesis when Pharaoh was going 
going to have a dream he had two dreams and those two dreams were actually similar and when joseph came to interpret he said do you know these two dreams they are pointing to the same thing and they are repeated because uh, it means so much of certainty these things are going to be fulfilled and then you'll find the same repetition as you look at uh, the new testament you'll find that matthew mark luke and john they're writing about the same personality you find a lot of repetition there and yet it is for emphasis if you have read ephesians and you have read colossians you'll see that there are similarities between two epistles those two epistles and it is for emphasis that those things will surely come to pass and as you look at second peter and you look at jude and you see similarities between them it is telling you that these things that we're reading about they will surely come to pass because the lord had decided them and has seen them and prophetically were given that this thing will actually happen the days of apostasy are here and it is not something surprising because the scripture had spoken about it now you have had a general feel for the epistle of jude and you have seen the content and you have seen the characteristics let's now go to point number two point number two call by christ into the faith call by christ into the faith look at uh, jude verse one jude a servant a bond slave of jesus christ and brother of james and he says to them that are sanctified by god the father and preserved in um, jesus christ and called now you need to understand something here in english language when you're writing in english when you say one two three generally in english you will put your emphasis on the first word for example here there are three things we learn about the saints about the children of god about the recipients of this epistle about the people that have been won number one they're sanctified by god the father number two they are preserved or kept in jesus christ and number three they are called in the greek language this word called actually comes last but in that language that's where the emphasis is it's a little bit different in english in english a uh, cult which is a very important emphasis uh, will be number one in our own mind and therefore to the english readers will be reading it this way jude the servant of jesus christ brother of james to them that are the cult and then sanctified and preserved in jesus christ that's why i titled that second point the call by christ into the faith and actually when you think about it you are called before you are preserved when you think about it you are called before you are sanctified or as other versions have been instead of that word sanctified beloved you are called before you are beloved and therefore we find the call is very important the emphasis is on that word to them that are called these people that are called are sanctified and they are preserved and kept in the lord jesus christ now this word call is very important in fact it is a key to our christian lives in matthew chapter 22 matthew chapter 22 reading from verse 14 matthew 22 14 says for many are called but few are chosen many are called but few are chosen that tells you then that the call comes general to everyone why will the call come in a general way to everyone for god so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life god calls everyone because he loves the whole world you remember the scripture is not willing that any should perish but at all shall come to repentance the call of god comes to everyone 
Repent ye, repent ye house of Israel. For why will ye die? I have no pleasure in the death of him that dieth. The call is coming to everyone who will have all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth in Jesus Christ. The call is coming to everyone. The spirit and the bride say come. He that heareth, let him, come, let him say come. And he that is a thirst, let him take of the water of life freely. The call is coming to everyone, but not everyone is accepting. Not everyone is embracing that call. That's why many are called, but few are chosen. Now, the people that are chosen are the people that receive the call in the terms, in the condition that God has given. It tells us to repent. It tells us to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And you repent and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, then you receive the call. When you receive the call, then you are referred to in a particular way you are referred to as the called not general now because you have responded that's why it says in romans chapter 8 look at it romans chapter 8 verse 28 we know that all things work together for good to them that love god to them who are you see that emphasis the call not just to them who are called it's not to every sinner that has had the gospel that all things work together for good, but for those who have responded, for they called according to his purpose. When you respond to the call, then you know that by the grace of God, you are now part of the chosen people. Revelation chapter 17. Revelation chapter 17, verse 14. These shall make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb shall overcome them. For he is the Lord of lords and the King of kings. They that are with him, now in eternity. They that are with him, beyond this earth. They that are with him are called, chosen, and faithful. These are the people that have responded. Because they have responded, they are chosen. And because after their choice, they remain faithful and they endure to the very end, it says they are the called and the chosen and the faithful. We need to talk about this call a little bit more. As you think about uh, the call, it's a really great privilege when the call of God comes to you. There are three things you need to know about the call. Number one, it's a holy calling. Number two, it's a high calling. Number three, it's a heavenly calling. That's exactly what the scripture says. Number one, it says it is a holy calling. In 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy, reading from chapter 1 and in verse 9. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 9. Who has saved us and called us with an holy calling. That calling that has come to you, that you have responded to, it is not an ordinary calling, it is a holy calling. Number two, it's a high calling. In uh, Philippians chapter 3, Philippians chapter 3, and in verse 14, I press forward toward the mark for the price of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus high calling it's holy it's high not only that it's heavenly in hebrews chapter 3 hebrews chapter 3 and in verse 1 where for holy brethren partakers of the heavenly calling and so as you look at your life and jude is telling us it's writing to the saints and he's telling us the saints is writing to there are three things about them they are called they are sanctified they are beloved and uh, they are preserved they are kept in the lord jesus christ and you look at that call that has come upon your life the lord calling you into the kingdom with a holy calling a high calling a heavenly calling but then what are the believers called to because when it says many are called what are we being called to and when we respond to that holy high heavenly calling what are we responding to into what have we been called number one we are called to fellowship of his son that's first corinthians chapter one verse nine 
was separated from the Lord before. Our sins separated us from the Lord. But then Jesus died on the cross. And through the death on the cross, he now reconciles us with the Father. And we are called to fellowship with his son these things write down to you that you have fellowship with us and not with us only a fellowship with the father and the son you are called to fellowship with the son number two you are called to inherit a blessing that's first peter chapter 3 verse 9 there is a blessing spiritual blessing heavenly blessing abundant blessing and we are called to inherit a blessing number three we are called to eternal life called to eternal life that's in first timothy chapter 6 and in verse 12 that's a verse that is telling us to fight the good fight of faith to lay hold on eternal life whereunto thou art also called we are called unto eternal life and then number four we are called to peace called to peace we're not called to confusion and fighting and commotion remember every time whenever something happens in the church or outside the church here is our calling we are called to peace first corinthians chapter 7 verse 15 then we are called to a worthy walk called to a worthy walk walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called ephesians chapter 4 and in verse 1 and this is important now we are called unto holiness in first thessalonians chapter 4 first thessalonians chapter 4 verse 7 for god has not called us unto uncleanness but unto holiness therefore you see the call of god we are called unto holiness those who answer god's call soon realize that we are called to be saints romans chapter 1 verse 7 we are called to be holy first peter chapter 1 and verses 15 and 16 and therefore make sure that your life matches the call your behavior matches the call. If you profess that you are among the few, you are among the chosen, you are among the people that have responded to the call of God, remember you are called to eternal life and you are called to be saints and you are called to be holy and you are called unto holiness. Let's come back to Jude verse 1. In Jude verse 1, it says, Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ, and uh, the brother of James to them that are sanctified by God the Father and preserved in Jesus Christ and called. I've told you there are three things we notice about the beloved people of God here. Number one, they are called. Number two, it says they are sanctified. Uh, authorities in Greek tell us that the word translated sanctified here should have been better translated to beloved. We're going to take uh, the word in both senses. You are called, you are beloved, you are sanctified, you are purified. In fact, is it not the life that we live? Is it not the outworking of the grace in us that sanctifies and purifies us, that makes us beloved in the sight of the Lord? So to start with, there is a sanctification sanctification by the father it is not sanctification in human strength it is not sanctification in human struggle it is not sanctification by suppression it is sanctification by god the father in first thessalonians chapter 5 first thessalonians chapter 5 reading from verse 23 and the very god of peace sanctify you holy and i pray god your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our lord jesus christ faithful is he that calleth you who also will do it even to this time god can still sanctify us is that not possible and in hebrews chapter 2 verse 11 hebrews 2 11 for both he that sanctifieth and they who are sanctified are all of one for which cause is not ashamed to call them brethren hebrews 13 verse 12 in hebrews 13 verse 12 wherefore jesus also that he might sanctify the people with his own blood suffered without the gate 
Sanctification is a possibility and a reality because we're sanctified by the cleansing of the blood of Jesus and we're sanctified by the power of God through Jesus Christ. Now, uh, James or Jude is telling us another thing. He tells us we're beloved, we're sanctified, and we're preserved in Jesus Christ. Do you see how important this preservation is? Because Jude is going to write about apostasy. And he's going to say that this thing is going to cover the world. And he's going to say that it's going to be a perilous time, a dangerous time. And uh, the believers are likely to be saying, if that is the case, how then shall we be able to stand? And Jude is going to give them encouragement right at the beginning of the epistle. And he's going to say, although the apostates will rise, Although the false teachers will rise up, and although very many bad things are going to happen, and yet you understand, we are preserved in Jesus Christ. That's important. But here is uh, something, uh, something that is given here for the privilege and for the encouragement of the believers. And here is something that the eternal security teachers will take and say, there you are, you see that. Many are called, but few are chosen. Those people that are chosen are chosen by God. And they are sanctified by God. And they talk about that sanctification as if that is automatic. If you are called, then you must respond. If you respond, then you must be sanctified. It doesn't depend on your prayer. It doesn't depend upon your consecration. The Lord does it for everyone that is called. And then they say, it says, those who are preserved in Jesus Christ. Telling us then that everyone that is called will be sanctified. And every one of them, they are going to be preserved. And they say, everything depends upon God completely. But do you see that uh, Jude doesn't give us that impression? Jude tells us in verse 21, keep yourself in the love of God. It tells us the part of God in verse, four, in verse 24. Now, unto him that's able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. Yes, there is a part of God. Yes, there is a power of God that's able to preserve you and able to keep you. But Jude strikes a balance. Jude tells us from verse 20, But he, beloved, building up yourselves, you have a part to play on your most holy faith. Praying, you have a part to play in the Holy Ghost. Keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto life eternal, unto eternal life. And so it's not an automatic thing. While you recognize that God has power to save and to keep, you also know that he works uh, in you. In fact, as you look at scripture, don't you see that double thing? Don't you see that there's a part that God plays and the part that you play as a child of God? We do not have time to refer to many verses of scripture, but just look at this in Philippians chapter 2. In Philippians chapter 2, he tells us in verse 12, Wherefore, my brethren, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence. Here comes your responsibility. Walk out your salvation of fear and trembling. There's no doubt about that. You have a part to play. Walk out your salvation with fear and trembling. But immediately in verse 13, lest you think, I'll go out and struggle through it. He reminds you, you need the help of God. Verse 13, for it is God that walketh in you, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. In verse 12, walk it out with fear and trembling. Walk it out with fear and trembling as if, if I'm not careful, I could be lost. Then he comforts you and he says, rely on the Lord. It is God that walketh in us, both to do and to will. Therefore, you will see that there is a part that God plays. Look at uh, the two epistles of Peter. Look at first uh, Peter to start with. First Peter chapter 1. 
and in verse 5 who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation ready to be revealed in the last time this uh, first epistle of Peter is telling us we are kept by the power of God turn to second Peter now second Peter Verse, chapter 1 verse 10 wherefore other brethren give diligence to make your calling and election sure for if ye do these things it shall never fall there are things to do if you do these things so you will see then as we're talking about the preservation of the believer god has a major part to play and you have your part to play as well but then we're happy about this that our god is mighty and powerful and that if we are willing to remain if we are willing to abide our lord is able to keep us in second timothy chapter 1 verse 12 second timothy chapter 1 verse 12 for the which cause i also suffer these things nevertheless i am not ashamed for i know whom i have believed and i'm persuaded that he is able to keep that which i have committed unto him against that day i have to commit it to him it's not going to force salvation on me it's not going to force eternal life on me he's not going to keep me in his kingdom against my will i have to commit my soul into his son once i do that this is the confidence every child of god should have he is able to keep that which we have committed into his hand until that day in chapter 4 second timothy chapter 4 verse 18 and the lord shall deliver me from every evil work amen and will preserve me unto his heavenly kingdom to whom be glory forever and ever and the church said amen and so the lord is able to preserve us jude has been uh, telling us that uh, we are called not only that we are beloved and sanctified and not only that we are kept we are preserved in jesus christ but then he tells us for our encouragement in jude verse 2 he says uh, if you have any problem being stable in the kingdom uh, here are the three things we need we need the mercy of god he said what brought us into the kingdom of god originally it is because of his mercy we are saved it's rich in mercy and love and it says remember as you are a christian that mercy is multiplied unto you you shouldn't backslide but should in case you backslide the same mercy that forgave you originally that mercy is still available mercy unto you and peace it says if you are now remaining in the lord you have the peace of god may you have an abundance of that peace uninterrupted peace peace that passes understanding but perhaps you have lost your peace because of sin that had come in it says there's still the multiplication of that peace peace be multiplied unto you you can still go back to the lord and the way you had peace of mind originally you can still have that peace today and love be multiplied you know he loves us he loved us before we came into the gospel god so loved the world and here is what we have learned that uh, when we were unlovable when we were enemies here god manifested commended his love toward us in that when we were yet enemies christ died for us if when we were enemies rebellious people he showed his love and he died for us how much more now you have come into the kingdom if you do something wrong don't think because of that he doesn't love me anymore he loved you as a rebel he loved you as an enemy he loved you as a sinner he loved you as an offspring of adam he loves you now come back into the realm of that love once again let me remind you that jude is very well balanced it's not saying that whatever you do wherever you go that love is always there and whether you respond or not that love will eventually take you to heaven look at jude now jude verse 21 keep yourselves in the love of god 
is saying that do you know there's something like a circle the circle of the love of god and you know the circle of that love of god step into that circle keep yourself in the love of god if you stray so far away from the arena from the area from the sphere of the love of god you may stray too far and that love may not be able to reach you there at least you know judas iscariot that went so far and that love was not able to reach him there then you know peter he sinned he backslid but then his attitude brought him to the realm and to the arena of the love of god and the lord received him back you stay in the arena in the sphere of the love of god and the mercy of god and the peace of god and the love of god be multiplied unto you now we go to point number three point number three is contending for the faith it says beloved when i gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation it was needful for me to write unto you and to exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints now this verse is saying something jude said beloved can i tell you the struggle i had can I tell you the problem I had as I picked up my pen and I opened up to the Lord to write unto you? He said, before I started writing, I determined I was going to write to you of the common salvation. All that was in my mind was to write unto you of the salvation common to the Jews and to the Gentiles, of the salvation that comes on the same condition, on the same terms, to the Jews and to the Gentiles, to the heathen and to the educated. I wanted to write of the common privilege, of the common grace of God, of the common salvation made available to everyone. And all of a sudden, what I intended to write, I didn't write. And now it became needful. That what became needful is uh, similar to the original when in the gospel it says, Jesus must needs go through Samaria. That was a divine compulsion. It appeared that this thing just changed the, uh, the way or the line of thought he wanted to write. He said, what I wanted to write before, I had to drop that now because the Holy Ghost conquered me and the Holy Ghost imposed this one on me. Therefore, everything you read is by inspiration. This is not just what I intended to write unto you. It was needful for me now to write unto you and to exhort you that ye should earnestly contain for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints before we look at uh, contending for the faith itself there are some words we need to examine and interpret in that uh, verse he says the believers are beloved he says beloved in fact uh, sometimes as we read the epistle of jude you think that the epistle is very hot and hard and that it looks like uh, the writer is very stern not so because you see the word beloved is the word that expresses the love and the affection of the writer to the people he was writing to and behind that affection of the writer is the affection and the love of god behind his back and going through him by illumination and inspiration to the people that he was writing unto and he mentions this word beloved directly three times in verse 3 beloved look at verse 17 in verse 17 but beloved remember and then look at uh, verse 20 but ye beloved build up yourselves and so you will see that although the message in the epistle might look very hard might look very stern you know that he was writing from the background of love and he referred to the believers as the beloved the word beloved appears more than 60 times in the new testament and i've shown you the times it appears in jude indicating the love of god behind the mind and in the heart of the writer to those who have been reaching to there's another word here in jude verse 3 it says the faith which was once delivered unto the saints he called the believers saints that's very very common in the bible that believers are referred to as saints rather than sinners you find some pe preachers and they think uh, they are being humble it's all right to be humble as long as you are scriptural 
if you are humble and you are not scriptural that humility is not acceptable in the sight of God anymore they think they are being humble and they say well although I'm a preacher I'm still a sinner I don't know about that what the Bible says is that believers are saints and because this is so important saints means the holy ones look at Psalm 50 very quickly the believers are referred to as saints in the word of God in Psalm 50 and in verse 5 gather my saints unto me gather my saints together unto me that have made a covenant with me by sacrifice where the saints of God is not pride that's what the blood of Jesus Christ has made us he has cleansed us, he has purified us, and he has given us the power to go and sin no more. We are saints. In uh, Psalm 89, Psalm 89, verse 7, God is greatly to be feared in the assembly of the saints. Not the assembly of the sinners, we are the saints of God in the assembly of the saints. In Psalm 97, Psalm 97, and reading from verse 10. Ye that love the Lord hate evil, he preserveth the souls of his saints. We are the saints of God, we are the holy ones. Psalm 116. In Psalm 116, and in verse 15, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints and you see the old testament the old testament is referring to children of god to the believers even the believers in the old testament the one who did not live to see the crucifixion of christ that did not have the fullness of the sacrifice of the lord jesus christ the old covenant purged them purified them and trans uh, translated their lives transformed them to become saints how about the new testament believers then acts chapter 9 Acts chapter 9 and in verse 13 then Ananias answered Lord I have heard by many of this man how much evil he has done to thy saints in Jerusalem the believers in Jerusalem were referred to as the saints in Jerusalem the Holy One in Jerusalem Romans chapter 12 Romans chapter 12 and in verse 13 distributing to the necessity of saints the members of the church when we are born again that's what we are we are the saints of God first Corinthians chapter 16 and I'm reading to you from verse 1 first Corinthians 16 1 now concerning the collection for the saints as I have given order to the churches of Galatia even so do ye and so the believers are referred to as saints uh, we need to emphasize this point so you will know that uh, you should even you should not be that sin conscious as if it is so compulsory for you you must be sinning every day and confessing sin every week you must understand that the children of god the people of god are not hypocritical people they are not just a fake counterfeit they are the genuine saints of god who live righteous life ephesians chapter 2 verse 9 verse 19 ephesians chapter 2 verse 19 now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners but fellow citizens with the saints if you have become a child of god you become fellow a fellow citizen with the saints of god in chapter 3 verse 8 unto me who am less than the least of the saints that's the humility it's not a sinner but the less than the least of the saints and i'm sure you are not taking that literally that actually paul was least or paul was the least in power in holiness and Paul was the least in revelation and in vision. It's just the expression of his humility. But the point is that he was still referring to the people of God as saints. Here comes the practical implication of being called saints. In Ephesians chapter 5 verse 3. But fornication and all uncleanness and no covetousness. Let it be not once named among you. Why? Don't you know who you are? As becometh 
says. And so we see that Jude is uh, using the same language we find all over the Old Testament and we find in the New Testament. It's telling us that we're the beloved of God and we are the same. But then it's now telling us something. It's telling us to contend. And uh, it's telling, look at it, in Jude verse 3, in the middle part, uh, to exhort you that ye should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. It tells us there is something that we have to do. We need to earnestly contend. Those two words actually are one word in the original Greek. And uh, it was a word that was used uh, in the Grecian games. And uh, what it means is to fight for something. Standing for a thing that is assaulted. And which the adversary wants to take away. And so fighting. So defending that thing. To protect that thing. And to retain that thing. When it says earnestly contend. It means strenuously defend that thing. And earnestly fight for that thing with greater strength. So that although the devil and the adversaries are trying to take it away from you, they will not be able to take it away from you. And in the Greek, the word rendered earnestly contend is in the continuous tense. It's not in the past tense. The word means therefore to continue to fight for the purity and the preservation of the faith till the very end of your life. And while you lay down the button, other people pick up the button and they also continue to strenuously fight and defend and earnestly contend for that same faith once delivered unto the saints. Now, when we talk about the faith, the faith is different from faith. Many people don't understand that. They think that when you talk about faith, 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 you are talking about faith by which we believe. That one is just an act of trusting the Lord. That's an act of depending upon the Lord. An act of believing God for something. That's the faith by which we believe. But the faith here is not that kind of faith. This faith is the sum total of all that we believe. That's different. That's called the whole counsel of God. When it says faith of our father standing still uh, you see that faith that we are laboring to preserve faith of our fathers is not the faith to believe in healing it's not the faith to get uh, salvation it's not the faith to get something it is the totality of the faith that we believe it is the sum total of the sound doctrine of the word of god it is it's a synonym for the entire gospel the whole revelation of God, the unchanging, permanent, irrevocable, always abiding, always binding word of God. It's the totality of everything that we believe is referring to as the faith. Honestly, contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. And you know, when you look at those words in English, you may not understand. It's saying, honestly, contend for the faith. For the gospel, for the entire truth, for the whole revelation, for the total counsel of God, which was once for all delivered unto the saints. Once for all delivered. That is, it's already delivered. It is given to the church and we are not adding to it. We are not subtracting from it. It is once for all delivered unto the saints. So if somebody comes today and he says, I have a new doctrine. And uh, I, this doctrine you will not find in the Bible, but it is very interesting. We say, no, that's of the devil. Because the faith we are to fight for, the faith we are to honestly contend for, the faith we are to defend has been once for all delivered unto the saints. And there is nothing to add and there is nothing to surprise. And therefore we have the responsibility that as the word of God is pure and perfect and it has been given to us and in fact Revelation chapter 22 verses 18 and 19 lays a curse upon anyone that will take away from the word or add to the word it's been given unto the saints and is given unto us once and for all and we're to earnestly contend for that faith 
And when we say earnestly contend, we're not to fight with carnal weapons. We're not to fight by arms like in the days of the persecution of the church when the Catholic Church persecuted the Protestants in a physical way just to preserve what they think was the truth. We're not to contend, we're not to fight with carnal weapons or by arms or by violence. And we're not to persecute anyone. How then are we to honestly contend? As we close this session, I give you these seven points. As we want to contend for the faith, how do we earnestly, earnestly contend for the faith once delivered unto the saints? Number one, by preaching the truth forcefully and with conviction. That's how to contend for the faith. If you keep quiet, you are not fighting for the faith, you are not contending for the faith, you will forcefully with conviction preach the truth of the word of god you will give unflinching unhesitating witness to the truth of the word of god that's in second timothy chapter 4 verse 2 preach the word the instant in season and out of season you are to rebuke you are to reprove and without long suffering and doctrine because the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine but you must earnestly contend by preaching it when it's convenient when it's not convenient number two by confronting false doctrine and having no fellowship with false teachers you confront false doctrine from your pulpit if any false doctrine is trying to get into your congregation, how do you honestly contend for the faith? You will take, pick up that false doctrine, tear it into pieces, and before the children of God, analyze that false doctrine and confront that false doctrine. And then, when you do that on your pulpit, you will not go outside the service and then have secret fellowship with the false teachers. Because then that will be a contradiction. Here you are on the pulpit, standing for the truth standing for the word of god defending the gospel that the lord has given unto us with conviction confronting false doctrine bringing it to the congregation analyzing it tearing it to pieces and convincing them by the word of god that that is not the truth this is the truth and then after you have done that on the pulpit you go outside you shake hands with the false teacher and say well i know you are preaching that don't mind me i just said that on the pulpit for my congregation but we are still friends and we are together you have destroyed what you did in the church if you are going to honestly contend for the faith once delivered on the saints you will have no fellowship with the false teachers ephesians chapter 5 verses 7 and 11 number three be as aggressive in spreading the truth as false prophets are in spreading error that's how to contend. You look at the Jehovah's Witnesses and you see the error they are perpetrating. And you see the gigantic printing press they have. And you see the way they will uh, mark themselves out and organize themselves and reach out and be sending literature to people and confusing people. You see how aggressive they are in uh, advertising error, publicizing error, proclaiming error, and destroying the lives of millions of people in this world. If you are to contend for the faith once delivered unto his saints, you will be as aggressive in spreading the truth in every way possible by literature by cassette by radio by enemies whatever you will be more aggressive than the false prophets in spreading the word of god and you'll be willing to go anywhere everywhere to make the word of god to be known i wouldn't um, I wouldn't uh, respect uh, anybody that says I love sound doctrine, I love the word of God and is sitting in a corner somewhere. There's no aggression. There's no conviction. There's no rushing out. There's no taking the Bible in your hand and going to the highway and the edges and calling the people to believe sound doctrine. If when the opportunity comes to get teaser the scripture in your church, you give excuse, I'm not well prepared. And when there's chance to go somewhere outside your territory, you are not ready to go 
there and preach the word of God. I wouldn't give a farthing for such a one. I don't believe that such a one that is just uh, hiding in the room and staying somewhere that is contending for the faith. I find I look at somebody contending for the faith and I see a man that is able to do more than the Pharisees, able to do more than the Sadducees, able to go beyond the Jehovah's Witnesses, able to do more than the seven day Adventist people on their Sabbath, able to do more than all the Confucianists around, and you are aggressively going out, and when you see one person that is confusing other people, you double your energy, you double your zeal, because you are to be as aggressive and more aggressive than all those people in Matthew chapter 23. And in verse 15, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye compass sea and land to make one proselyte. And when he is made, ye make him twofold more the child of hell than yourselves. You see the aggressiveness and the zeal uh, of uh, the false prophets, they will compass land and sea. That means if they need to take a boat to go there, they will go there. At that time, there was no aeroplane. If there was aeroplane, Jesus would have said, you compass land to use vehicle, sea to use boat, and air to use aeroplane. You will go anywhere with any means to go and reach the people, and yet you are confusing them, and you are making them two full children of hell than yourself. Therefore, if we say we are contending for the faith, we will be as aggressive as those people able to travel on land, by sea, by air, and reach out to the people and give them the word of God. Number four, charge all leaders all workers all members that they teach no other doctrine if you are honestly contending for the faith you'll do that you will look at what your study scripture teachers are teaching you'll see what they're teaching in the house fellowship you'll you'll see what the people in the retreat what they are teaching and you will charge them you will not be so friendly with somebody and say brother uh, that thing you taught uh, the other time actually will bring confusion on the people and you shouldn't have taught uh, you know like that in fact uh, it's like uh, I don't want to oppose you but it's like you are teaching them that even if they commit sin they will still go to heaven well I hope that you are not trying to preach eternal security to those people unconditional security to them well let's be very careful let's compliment one another in teaching you are not contending for the faith if you are that friendly if you are that nice, if you are that tolerant of the people that are teaching false doctrine in your congregation and you just uh, smile over it, gloss over it, then you are not contending for the faith. To contend for the faith will mean that you charge all the leaders, all the preachers, all the workers, all the members that they teach no other doctrine and you stop those who deviate to false doctrine from preaching and ministering. You take the microphone away from them you take the pulpit away from them and take them away from the pulpit you tell them here is where we stand without holiness no man shall see the lord if you are not willing to preach that go and sit down if you are not willing to sit down then you can walk out you are going to be very firm and very strict and stop the people that are teaching any other doctrine if you don't have backbone to your conviction, you are not going to do that. You are going to be like an amphibian, a jellyfish that is not able to stand here, not able to stand over there. You are not able to rebuke anybody with authority and with conviction. But that's what you have to do in Titus, Titus chapter 1. Titus chapter 1 and uh, reading to you from verse 11. Whose mouth must be stopped? That's how to contend for the faith once delivered unto the saints, whose mouth must be stopped. And in verse 13 days is true witness, wherefore rebuke them nicely. Is that what it says? You see, psychology is coming into deeper life. And it is this psychology of, you know, the esteem of everyone and the self-respect for everyone. And therefore, don't touch anyone. And if you are going to say anything at all, uh, don't say it in the open. Call him to the private. And don't come directly. Don't say, this is wrong. Say, brother, do you think this is right? 
let him take the conclusion that's what psychology teaches us what the bible teaches us it says wherefore rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in the faith therefore it is not we don't want psychology here we want the word of god here the people that are here i suppose are the people that want to get to heaven am i right let a righteous man smite me it will be ointment upon my head if we get to the situation where somebody is teaching false doctrine within the church and we cannot rebuke him sharply and talk to him there's no church again everything has become psychology but then if you are going to earnestly contend for the faith once delivered unto the saints charge them that they teach no other doctrine number five sever all relationships all relationships with perpetrators of error and evil you're not going to keep a friend a jehovah's witness friend seventh day adventist friend backsliding false prophet ex deeper life friend whatever they are whoever they are once a person stops believing the word of god and stops standing upon the same word of god that we stood upon before it's a pity we call it relationship except he's willing to come back to that same word why because i don't want anybody befriending me and my members seeing that and saying well although that is x deeper life although that person is no more preaching sound doctrine but pastor is still friendly with him therefore let us go and listen to him i don't want them to go and listen to an ex preacher of holiness ex preacher of sound doctrine if they are ex and they are no more in you're caught away from them that is earnestly contending for the faith once delivered unto the saints and uh, what i'm telling you i say it everywhere uh, i think uh, recently uh, one of the people that left uh, deeper life uh, saw me and uh, you know he you know we discussed together and he said that uh, you know why all this supposing you know those who have gone i said sit down put yourself in my position that here we have deeper life and i have those members there and i have a responsibility my responsibility is that i don't want those people to scatter because i don't know where they, where they will scatter to i don't know if uh, they live deeper life where they will go they may go here they may go there they may go there and uh, if all those places they are scattered to if they are teaching them the word of god i won't talk because i'll say even though they are no more in deeper life will meet in heaven then i said let's face the fact if i don't talk and i allow the people to scatter they will scatter to the places where their bones will be broken they will lose their lives will not be able to gather them back again i said if you put yourself in my position what should i preach he said he understood so i told him that recently i had workers retreat and i treated first john and in first john there is a verse there chapter 2 verse 19 and i read it and i said this is what i said about that verse i said as a preacher of the word i am duty bound when i found a verse of that like that in the bible i close my mind to whoever is out there faithfully interpreting the word of god i interpret that word of god i gave him the interpretation i gave to that word of god that they went out from us they are not among us anymore i said my interpretation was that before they left in their mind doctrinally they had left us before they physically left i said that is what i said and he looked at me he knew that there was nothing else i could have done you see when you stand on the pulpit you have a responsibility and i have a responsibility to those of you who are there and when i stand here i am to earnestly contend for the faith once delivered unto the saints and i pass the baton into your hand you go to your local government go everywhere the same thing i do here the same thing you do over there amen and you too you earnestly contend for the faith once delivered unto the saints then number six you support faithful pastors and teachers who teach the word of god without compromise number seven you train others who will be able to get so sound as to effectively teach the whole truth and live by the whole word of god we have looked at verses one two and three of Jude today and what uh, the emphasis and the key and the center the pivot of what uh, this uh, these verses are telling us 
is that by the grace of God we are called. And as we respond to that call, he sanctifies us. And as he sanctifies, he's able to keep us. And he says his mercy and his peace and his love will be multiplied in our lives. And then he tells us that the salvation we have is not a special salvation. It's a salvation that is common to both Jews and Gentiles. Anybody that gets saved anywhere, it is the same salvation. And thank God you've got that salvation. I said thank God you've got that salvation. Now you are not just a saved soul, just a beloved person, just a saved. You are now a minister of the gospel. And here is the responsibility the Lord has committed into your hand. Earnestly contend for the faith once delivered unto the saints. Will you do it? Yes. The Lord will help you. And if you do it faithfully on the final day, the Lord will reward you in Jesus' name. Yes. Why don't you ask God? Why don't you ask God for grace and for more of his love, for more of his mercy, and for more of the peace of God? Already he tells us that the love and the mercy and the peace and the grace of God and the blessing of God will be multiplied unto you. Multiplied unto you. If you have responded to the call of God, and if right now you have committed your soul into the hand of the Lord so that he will preserve you until the final day, he sanctifies, he makes you a beloved, and then he keeps, he preserves your life. Then you are to honestly contend, honestly contend, honestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints earnestly 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 contend for the faith once delivered unto the saints don't compromise don't preach uh, fervently in the pulpit and then be smiling to false prophet outside don't you have conviction don't you love the truth are you not standing by the truth are you a hypocrite are you just paying lip service to the truth or do you really want the truth love the truth stand by the truth defend the truth honestly contend for contending for the faith once delivered unto the saints stand firm in the word of god stand firm in the word of god you know the truth stand in it stand by it if you do not have the love for the truth to stand by it, maybe you are not even born again. If you are attached to the false prophets, then you are separated from the Lord. If you are friendly to false prophets, you are an enemy of God. Stand for the truth. Stand for the truth. If it's your husband that goes into error, you cannot buy that error. You cannot support that error. And you cannot be defending that error just because it's your husband. Love Christ more than husband. If it's your wife that goes into error, you cannot be defending the error because she's your wife. Stand with Christ. Love Christ above your wife. Stand for the truth. If it's your father that is a Jehovah's Witness, or it's your mother that is Seventh-day Adventist, that doesn't mean you are going to go to the uh, law, the ceremonial law of Moses, because your mother is there. Stand for the truth and defend this word of God. Earnestly contend.